Have potty break. We're ready for this part now. So these are some interesting things. I love these. Well, I don't want to sound morbid, but I think it's kind of patient. It's pretty fast. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. All right, guys. So it's going to be really important you pay particular attention to what is your priority with this type of patient. Okay. So in our infective endocarditis, where are we at? If I say endocarditis, on the inside. Okay, so what structures are in the interior? Valves. Your valves, that's right. Those are the, we're talking about valves, cordae, tendinae, papillary muscle. Okay. You know from 102, your principal agents, fungi, protozoa, bacteria, viruses, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you know those things. We're going to talk about pathology, how do they get there, and then we're going to talk about the complications associated with that. These are just some of the ways that pathogens can enter. In, in a nutshell, the pathogen is successful in the bloodstream, it can go these ways, okay? So if they did have a dental procedure, maybe they have most of your tattoo parlors today have very strict guidelines they must adhere to in terms of the whatever they use, the little instruments they use to create the tattoos, um, sterile guidelines, things like that. But that doesn't mean everybody uses those types of places to get tattoos, okay? Um, piercings, granny did it at home versus you went to a place that required everything to be sterile or whatever, okay? So these are some of the ways. Your IV drug abusers are very suspect to this. As a matter of fact, many of my infective endocarditis patient, carditis patients were substance abusers. Because what, what does a substance abuser not use? A clean needle, okay? Um, and they get really, really sick. Your, why would your elderly people be more prone to this? Their immune system's retired, essentially. But that's true of any type of infection, isn't it? You're very young and you're very old. You're very old and, y'all, 65's not old. But your geriatric patient, their immune system is fatigued. It is combating other things, okay? You're very young, haven't built up enough immunity, okay? So they're, they're always the tunes of the spectrum that will be more vulnerable. Um, anytime we've had a artificial something in our body, for whatever reason, pathogens tend to like to go there, okay? So like if they've got an implantable device, not only can the procedure somehow introduce a contaminant, isn't that true of any surgical procedure? Yes. But also the device itself. Like haven't you ever heard that tuberculosis can actually go to a joint? Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that, pretty cool stuff. See, I love, this is nerdy stuff and I love it. Tuberculosis can actually go to a joint that's been replaced, okay? So you think tuberculosis, that's young, lungs, but it can. So we look at the different things that the patient's had. If they've already got some structural defects or we've already got a sick, non-functioning area in the, in the heart, that's where things like to tend to go. So we've got different portals here. Um, something I want you to think about and take personal account of before is your IVs that you're starting on your patient. Are you using the appropriate technique? Are you ensuring that your patient isn't going to be subject to a secondary infection now as a result of your sloppy procedure. And something that you might want to do, I don't care how obnoxious that person is, you might want to check yourself and say, if this was somebody I love, would I be doing something different right now? And if the answer is yes, you need to check yourself. Okay? There are going to be some people that are really difficult to take care of. That doesn't give you the right, ethically or morally, to compromise their care. Okay? So check yourself and ask yourself, would I do this differently if this was someone I cared about? And if your answer is yes, you know what you need to do, right? Okay. And don't think that through a root cause analysis, they cannot go back to where the problem began. Okay? Y'all ever watch Forensic Files or Criminal Minds? <laughs> You'd be amazed what you can't get away with now. All right. What <coughs> happens when these agents infect our valves is they develop these things we call vegetations. So look at this valve. Look at this picture. This little clusters we call vegetation. Amy, what would be something that you would be concerned about just looking at that picture up there? What would you be thinking about those vegetations that are concerned? Um, what could happen to them? Okay, it could 
certain function of it. Um, who else? Eva. That's right. And how could it create an invoice? Okay, so a thrombus is stationary, an invoice is a traveler. So how could this become an invoice? It breaks off. And what does your body do when it detects a foreign substance through the inflammatory process? It attacks it by creating a clot, right? Remember, this is just a normal mechanism going on in your body. It doesn't know that in effect it could cause you more problems than it had to start with, correct? It just knows that, hey, there's something here we need to break down and get rid of. There's no hairspray holding this down. My sister has straight blonde hair. She's taller than I am. She's younger than I am. She's taller than I am. Straight blonde hair. And in the bathroom, for whatever reason, I always took the sink on the front of the part of the bathroom. And I had to walk through this VO5 cloud every morning because this don't have hairspray on it, okay? And I'm like, y'all know that old Aquanet old ladies used to use? Don't tell your grannies I said that, if they still use it. But I mean, that nothing moves with that, right? It's like you move the hair and the whole hair dude moves to the side. Y'all seen those little old ladies at church? And the whole hair goes, You're like, woo, little crunchy. There's nothing keeping this plaque stable. It could easily break off. And when it does, through the normal response of a body, inflammatory response is going to kick in. It's going to aggregate all kinds of what? Cells around there. You got red blood cells, you got platelets, and we've created what? An embolus. And where is it going to travel? The to the brain or to the body? Anywhere. Depending on where it's at, right? Depending on which valve is affected will determine where that thing goes. So when you have a patient with infective endocarditis, the thing that you're going to primarily monitor your patient for is what we call vegetative embolization. What do we mean? We took a piece of vegetation and we made an embolus out of it. So you're going to be monitoring your patient constantly for vegetative embolization. These are some findings that you might have with a patient who has infective endocarditis. And the pictures kind of tell you what's what. Feet would be expected because we have an inflammatory response, correct? Okay. A murmur, why? Because as Amy identified, the valve isn't functioning correctly anymore. If a valve can't direct flow in the appropriate manner, could that not result in the heart not functioning as it should? Yeah. Okay. Rhythm disturbances, all kinds of nasty little complications, but look at that TIA, CVA. And don't just think brain, aren't there other parts of the body that these clots could go to? Could they not go to the lungs? Could they go to the mesenteric artery, renal arteries? Okay, so we have to look for the signs and symptoms of this and look for these little telltale signs that my patient probably has this. Now, understand that if you've got a known diagnosis of infective endocarditis, these little things right here would be expected findings. Not the whole list over here, not the TIA, the CVA, but these little splinter hemorrhages, ulcers, nodes, you would probably see these on your patients as an expected finding. Like that tire pressure light comes on when your tire's flat. It's an expected finding, although it's abnormal. But I'm monitoring my patient for signs of vegetative embolization. Signs that, uh oh, something has broken off and now we've got clots in the arterial space feeding something. Let's just give you a little picture of what it looks like. Okay. Um, how are we going to diagnose it? Well, we're going to do blood cultures. We'll identify what pathogens run around in the bloodstream. Um, the SED rate is very helpful in diagnosing this because what does the SED rate tell you? if there's an inflammatory process taking place. It doesn't tell us where it's at, right? It just tells us if we have an elevated set rate that we have an inflammatory process going on. This is ophageal echocardiogram. Remember I was talking about this the other day. This is that procedure that they use to look at that function of the valves and this is often the type of patient you'll see them do a TEE on. 2D echocardiogram, again we're looking at the function of the valves, okay? So, what are we going to do for this patient? Well, if it's a non-surgical route, we're going to start with 
penicillin is the drug of choice for a bacterial pathogen. If they're allergic to penicillin, they'll use erythromycin, EES, erythromycin, if they're allergic to penicillin. Amphotericin B is used for those fungal infections. And, and you don't need to memorize this, but fungal infections are really hard to treat, guys. Most patients stay sick for a while. And if necessary, we may have to replace that valve or just the ring or some leaflets. It depends on what disease process happened. Look at how long your patient's going to need IV antibiotic therapy. Two to six weeks, and almost always they go to the full six weeks. So home health care. What kind, and this is just for you to quickly think, you had a central venous access device, ATI assignment. It's doing you no good if you didn't apply what you learned. Think about the different types of IV accesses and what is the purpose based on time for each type of device. Which type of device would be good for six weeks? Which type of device would be good for patients, for instance, with chemo that we don't know that there's a termination date? Okay? So take those things that you've, assignments you've been given, and, and make them meaningful to you. Okay? Six weeks of IV antibiotic therapy is typically the course of time. Um, we're going to monitor temperature, okay, and we're going to teach our patient when they go home with home care to monitor temperature. Because we're not going to discharge, we don't discharge people with active fever, do we? Because we know we haven't gotten on top of anything yet, okay? They're at home, and now we want to make sure that they are monitoring their body temperature, right? Well, can they do that when they're sleeping at night? So what do we want to teach that patient? If you wake up in the morning or if you wake up during the night with this, night sweats, that's right. What does that tell you? You've had a fever. You need to report that. If you've got chills, you need to report that. Because what is it telling us? If the patient has been discharged, they're home getting home care, and they've had a recurrent fever, what is that telling us as providers? That's right, our antibiotic therapy isn't working anymore. We need to change course. Something needs to be, we need to revisit our plan. Okay? Um, what, what, what is it telling us when you're in pale yellow? That's right, and what, keep going, bring that thing a little bit further. What's the word we're looking for? Adequate perfusion. We have adequate perfusion to the tissues. Your kidneys are really good tattletales, okay? Constantly assessing heart sounds. Obviously, we want this patient to have a lot of rest periods, okay? We have a heart that is sick. We kind of need to make sure it's going to be restful before this patient is back, okay? And again, I stress that um, vegetative embolization. Okay, monitoring your patient for signs of vegetative embolization. Now, pericarditis, we're switching gears, we're on the outside now. Y'all remember Mr. Um, Aaron Gilmore from SIM? Okay, <coughs> he presented with streptococcal pneumonia that he didn't get treated right away for. And the strep was successful at invading the bloodstream, and here we go, we went to the pericardium now. Okay, what were the hallmark signs of pericarditis pain? Sharp, but when was it worse? Laying, Laying, flat. Laying flat. The pain is much more pronounced supine. And why is that? Because those layers grate. When a patient starts to sit up, the layers tend to separate ever so slightly and relieve some of that pain. So it's a sharp pain, or it's worse when I cough, sneeze, deep breathe, do whatever I need to do. Um, definitely worse when I lay flat. What heart sound did we detect this time that was an abnormal one? A pericardial friction. Rub. And again, if you don't know what that sounds like, you guys, you have you have Google, you have YouTube. You don't have to rely on a actual clinical experience to hear one to know. Okay, now let's look at where it's at. First, let's, okay, let's talk about some other things that can cause that, not just like a strep infection, but we've got some other things. If a patient has malignancies, we can cause an inflammatory process. Um, and a heart attack itself, isn't that going to in, um, include the inflammatory process as the heart muscle heals? Okay. Connective tissue, renal failure, we have a chronic inflammatory process going on. But look at where it's at, because this is what's so important. We're talking about the pericardial sac, okay? Everybody got the visual there? Because as we go on, you're gonna think, we talked about the, we talked about all these different symptoms here. Again, you gotta elevate the sed rate, because it's an inflammatory process. 
Okay. We're going to get to this in just a second. How does this affect cardiac output? We're going to get that here in just a second. What do we need to do to the patient? We need to hospitalize them. We need to monitor their cardiac output. Um, we use often ibuprofen because it's a really good anti-inflammatory. Now we use it at prescription strength, not over-the-counter strength, obviously. But it's a really good anti-inflammatory. Uh, we're going to treat the causative organism. If it was a bacterial agent, we're going to treat it with an antibacterial. Okay? Steroids, because steroids do what to the inflammatory response? That's right, decrease it. So that's what we're trying to event, prevent here. I'm going to get to the um, interventions here in just a minute. These interventions can be used prophylactically or in response to a complication. But I'll explain those in a second when I've got a better picture. Indocin, you know, we used to use a lot of indocin. Um, we don't use it today because it tended to cause coronary artery disease. Okay, we found out through the years. But speaking of indocin, <coughs> while I'm there, remember you have a PEDS module. Hope you've already looked through your slides, right? And on Tuesday, I will go over the high points of that. There, I, no, you've got like a hundred and some slides in there. Um, we're gonna, I want you to go over the big things like tetralogy of flow, patent ductus arteriosus, and I'll bring those up on Tuesday, okay? But you'll need to think about indocin in relationship to how does it treat one of those anomalies, okay? Because it's prostaglandins. All right, here's our complication. This is what can happen with pericarditis. So we have this sac around the heart that is becoming inflamed. Ladies, if you've ever worn a really cute pair of shoes, but they really didn't fit your foot right, what happened to your foot? You got a blister, didn't you? What was the purpose of the blister? It's an inflammatory response, normal process to protect injured tissue. So you have this fluid-filled space that's there to cushion the injured tissue, protect it from further injury, right? That's what's going on here. Only we've got a mega blister in, la in layman's terms, okay? You've got this pericardial sac that is filling with fluid. Why? Because it's protecting the injured tissue. It's a normal physiological response. However, this normal physiological response can cause serious complications. Imagine the effect of this, what we call effusion, pericardial effusion. What does that effect have on the ability of the heart to contract or rest and fill during diastole? profoundly decreasing. It's kind of like you're taking the heart and you're squeezing it. See where I'm going with that? So now can you see the effect that it would have on cardiac output? Is it going to increase it or decrease it? Decrease it because it can't fill. Volume is still going to enter the right atrium from the body, but it's kind of like, okay, well, what do I do now? Where am I going to go? So, there is a triad of symptoms that are associated with a cardiac tamponade that a nurse must be astutely aware of. So we talked about infective endocarditis. Your primary is to monitor for vegetative embolization. When you've got a pericarditis patient, your priority is to monitor for a cardiac tamponade. What are the signs and symptoms of a tamponade? Muffled heart sounds. Why is that? Because you're not hearing that function of the valves anymore. JVD, why is that? Because volume is backing up, isn't it? It's not going any further when it gets through there. And then this thing we call pulsus paradoxus. Pulsus paradoxus is where when your patient takes a breath in, their systole will drop by 10 or more millimeters of mercury. Who wants to try to tackle the pathway behind that? Just critically thinking your way through what's going on here. I'm taking a deep breath in. What am I doing to intrathoracic volume? Increasing it or decreasing it? I'm increasing <coughs> volume, right? When I increase volume, what else do I increase? Right along with it, pressure. Everything in here has got to have room to do its job. If I've got a pericardial effusion, which is already compromising the ability of the heart to fill during diastole, and now I've increased the pressure in that chest cavity, haven't I further reduced the ability of the heart to fill? Patient exhales, blood pressure goes back. Do y'all see that phenomenon? 
Okay, that's called Pulse's Paradoxes. So if we have JVD, multiple heart sounds, Pulse's Paradoxes, you've got a contaminant. What's the next thing you're going to do? The very next thing, call. Don't be blowing the nasal cannula out of the yin yang. You're not going to help them. I'm not telling you that we're not going to do that. I'm telling you your priority is what? Contact the provider. Your patient's going to die if you don't. Because what they need, you can't do. Okay? The only way you're going to know muffled heart sounds are there is to do what? Reassess, reassess, reassess. Do I need a reason to reassess a patient with pericarditis or don't I know every time I walk in this room I'm going to lay the suspect on their chest? Nobody had to tell me that, right? Because I'm concerned about this. And if I can't hear heart sounds, am I going to go out there and get my friend and say, hey, come here, can you hear these? No, you heard them all ago, and they're <coughs> there right now, or they're very muffled now. Don't, don't, I don't need anybody else to confirm that. I know what I heard earlier. I know what I'm not hearing now, okay? So don't waste your patient's time when I'm getting to you, because what they need is a pericardial window or a pericardial synthesis, which is this. So pericardial synthesis, synthesis means we drew fluid off of something, correct? If I had an arthrocentesis, what do we do? Drew fluid off of a, a joint, okay? If I had a paracentesis, we drew fluid off the belly. Thoracentesis, we drew fluid off the pleural space. Now I'm doing a pericardial synthesis, we're drawing fluid off of the pericardial sac. You can't do that, can you? The provider's got to do that. They may do a pericardial window, which is where they peel back part of that pericardium and let it lay open. Take it off. Peel it open. Okay? Depends on the condition of the patient. Again, this can be done prophylactically. If we've already got enough evidence that, you know, we've got a pretty significant effusion going on here. They may do it before the symptoms of a tamponade present. Okay? It's like it's earlier on a prophylactic basis. But this can also be done as an emergent basis. Okay? So I know what I'm monitoring my patient for who has pericarditis. I know what I'm, my priorities are, okay? Now some of these itises are going to blend over because at the end of the day, if we've affected this part of the heart or this part of the heart, these are the common things you might see, right? So if I'm talking about carditis, what's inflamed? Everything. So you're going to have symptoms of endocarditis and symptoms of pericarditis, aren't you? Because we've got all layers of flame to it. Not only that, the muscle is affected. So here we have more complications. We have a muscle that won't contract appropriately anymore. Look at the, path the pathogen. Group A strep. Bad boy. Girl. It. <laughs> Whatever that is. All right, so what do you find on assessment? Tachycardia, because why? What's the, what's the um, sympathetic response going on here? Why is it occurring? We're trying to maintain adequate perfusion <coughs> by the body, body, okay? We did that little example on the board. Y'all remember the reduction of stroke volume? Okay. Um, enlarged heart. All this stuff, just it's, it's a blend of all things together. Don't, don't worry about Ashoff's nodules. You see those on an autopsy, okay? What can we do to prevent this? Let's treat appropriately any type of strep my patient may have, especially that strep pharyngitis, and make sure that our patients understand, or the parents, or the provider of care, that we've got to finish <coughs> the full course of the medication therapy. Okay? This are, these are those Ashoff's nodules I was talking about a minute ago. So myocarditis, we've got the muscle again here specifically. We're going to have the same things once again, okay? Here, for, um, you can add um, COVID to this list now. COVID causes myocarditis. It's that same viral mechanism. And again, antibiotics. Anytime you have a distortion of cardiac muscle, your patient's going to be prone to dysrhythmias. It's kind of like the wall in your house. Think of your heart muscle as the wall in your house. If I go knocking at a wall and have no regard for the fact that there's electricity in that wall, am I not, could I not be remodeling the electricity? Or rendering it ineffective, or it's rerouted now. And so your muscle has those electrical conduction pathways within it and they can be altered and then lead your patients to dysrhythmias, okay? 
takes a long time till his heart gets better, guys. You see that? Half a year. All right. Let's see if I can answer this one. I'll give you a few minutes to read it. to this image so that you can see the differences in the, in the structure of the heart. So we've got a normal heart up here, and we've got these three disorders that we're going to talk about down here, okay? So, dilated is the one you're going to see most commonly in your healthcare setting. Um, your primary patient, and y'all please understand, don't label people, okay? Don't. Don't label people. Don't say, well, they're so-and-so, so they got to have such-and-such. Such. That's not true. But commonly, your dilated cardiomyopathy patient is your alcoholic. Not always. So make sure you don't label people. That's not cool. But commonly, this is your alcoholic. It can also occur, though, at any point in time during pregnancy. During pregnancy, after pregnancy. Alcohol, you know, there's a, the term intoxicated. Where do you think that came from? What is it saying? When we say a person's intoxicated, what is the, what's an, it was a layman's word we could use instead? Toxic, what does that mean? Too much. What does toxic mean? Bad for bad for the X, the skull and crossbones? Yeah. Okay. On your rat poison, what is that called? Poison. Toxic means poisoned. The term intoxicated means your patient is poisoned. Okay? That's what it means. Now we, we always associate the behaviors associated with intoxicated, but you're not thinking about what the word means. The patient has ingested enough of this substance that they are now poisoned. Okay? Alcohol is very destructive to brain tissue and cardiac tissue in an unforgiving manner. Okay? It destroys those cells, and they don't regenerate. So long-term alcohol abuse, this is what our patients often will end up with, okay? But again, do not blame, don't label people. There are plenty of people who have this and have never used alcohol. Um, chemotherapy, why? Because is chemotherapy specific to the, path, the, the cells it's trying to set to kill? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's non-specific. Ischemic, a patient may have a chronically ischemic heart, and we're gonna see this effect. So your severe CAD that's inoperable or otherwise can't be managed other than medicine. And then we have this fancy word medicine that means we don't have a clue. Idiopathic. We don't have a clue. Okay? So what happens, because it's a progressive disease process, and remember, look, remember that first slide shows you the size of the heart, how big it is, and how large those chambers are. Did you see that? Isn't there a max capacity for preload there? A lot of volume. And how strong is this heart? It's not. It's weak. That rubber band has been stretched too many times. The balloon has been blown up too many times. It no longer recoils with the strength it had before. Okay? So, they're going to have progressive dyspnea on exertion. As, they, as this disease process goes forward, initially the symptoms will be with exertion. Late stage, it'll be at rest. Um, so activity of all, uh, intolerance. As the left side continuously backs up to the pulmonary system, eventually the right side's going to fail. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to reduce preload. 
and we need to reduce afterload, don't we? Isn't that going to create a more effective pump? We might want to work on some contractility here. But look at the cardiac, the antiarrhythmics. Again, we've had a remodeled wall. <coughs> it is going to alter electrical conduction pathways. And this patient is at high, high risk for sudden cardiac death. So we talked about, on day one, about ejection fraction. Remember I said we, re re we would revisit it? This is where. So ejection fraction is the percentage of volume that leaves. Well, what did we say was a normal ejection fraction? 50% or higher. When your patient has an EF in the 40s, they're at moderate risk for sudden cardiac death. When it's in the 30s or below, they are at high risk for sudden cardiac death. V-fib, VTAC. I'm talking about pulses, VTAC. So these are the patients that need an ICD, an internal cardioverter defibrillator. Implantable is actually what the I stands for. Implantable cardioverter defibrillator. And I'll, I'll get to the differences between those two when we get to that section. Um, why do we want to have a low sodium diet? Reduces preload, doesn't it? <coughs> Isn't it true that if I reduce my sodium intake, I'm reducing preload? Okay. Um, and accordingly, fluid restriction. We talked about ICD. I'll get, um, and we're going to. And on part four, we'll go into ICD further. Lifestyle, just significant lifestyle changes at this point, okay? Because they're not going to go back to the way they were. This is a progressive disorder, and it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And eventually, potentially, a heart transplant. And again, this is why it's important that you what know what normals are. This has happened to me more than once in my career. And one time, I vividly recall my patient, the cardiologist had made rounds, and... I was with the cardiologist when they, in those days, you had to make rounds with all your docs in the unit anyway. And a little while later, I went to the patient's room, the patient was crying, and I, I said, you know, I asked them what was going on, and they said, that doctor said I've only got 50% of my heart working. I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, I could strangle your docs, too, sometimes. Because, I don't know about you, but it, if you told me I had a 50% EF, I'm probably going to think the exact same thing. Wouldn't you? Because my normal is 100 I don't know about you, but 100 is normal to me. If we don't take the time to explain that to the patient, they walk away thinking they've got a half-functioning heart. I know 50% is normal. You're in good shape, okay? That helps them understand that. So, again, you being intelligent to know how to respond to your patient is really important. All right? They're, they're depending on us. Um, so let's go look at that heart one more time. Y'all see it over here, the dilated cardiomyopathy, how large those chambers are. There's a max capacity here for preload. Unfortunately, because it's a weak heart, it can't contract it and get the volume out. So we need to help the heart. We need to help to reduce any resistance that it needs to eject blood out. We need to reduce the volume that it has to deal with in the first place and potentially increase its force, okay? But we're also going to throw on antiarrhythmic because we want to make sure that we, we recognize they're at high risk for sudden death, okay? All right, now, we'll get transplant in Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, back to Carly Shapiro. Codes on you in the sim lab. All right, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a congenital issue. It's, it's genetic, rather. It's passed down through from parent to child on through generations. There is a structural difference in your heart. Look at... Let's look at the picture again and compare it to our normal. Okay. If I look at my hypertrophic walls and look at my normal walls, look at your size of your ventricle as compared to your normal ventricle. Do you see the differences? Okay. And I want you to look at one more thing. Do you see an obstructed pathway? Look at that. This is what we would call, there's a non-obstructive and obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. <coughs> obstructive is worse than non-obstructive. At least with non-obstructive, we've got a pathway out, okay? This is obstructive um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, these patients often have no idea there's anything wrong with them. Because, you know, we don't take a five-year-old child and run them through a CAT scan just because. And if you think about what a physical consists of to play sports, it's nothing invasive. It's not a heart cath or anything like that, right? And that wouldn't be prudent, would it? 
I mean, how many people would be playing sports? Mm-hmm. Mom and dad had to pay for a heart cath too. Mm-hmm. No, they're not, okay? I mean, it, it wouldn't even be prudent. But it takes us understanding if there was a family history, there probably needs to be a more in-depth investigation as to whether or not this child, this young adult, this teenager can participate. Let's make sure this child's heart isn't affected if the parent's heart was. Because these are your kids that are running down the football field and they arrest on the field. <coughs> these are those kids that are playing basketball and they code on the court. They're running track and they, they arrest because they've just gone into V-fib or VTAC without a pulse. VTAC, remember VTAC can have a pulse, guys, okay? But they're not walking around shopping at Walmart looking at you having a conversation. VTAC with a pulse is the color of your table. And they don't feel good and they are hypotensive, okay? It's not like they're all walkie-talkie. But VTAC often does not have a pulse with it and V-fib never has a pulse with it, okay? So, this person goes into a, which is why now, not only for sports injuries like C-spine injuries, head injuries, things of that nature, but it's also why we have EMS now at events, okay? Um, my youngest was 19 years old, not my youngest child, my youngest patient with this, was 19 when I took care of her. She coded walking across her high school stage at graduation. That's when they found out she had this anomaly. Just that little excitement of, Oh, hope my family doesn't embarrass me, make a fool out of me, going across the stage, and everybody's looking at me, and I'm about to get my diploma coated on the stage. Thank goodness, because of modern days, EMS was at her graduation, and were able to defibrillate her very promptly, and she now is at ICD. Now, that was quite some time ago, so she's probably a young adult now. But she was 19, and she did not have any idea she had this disorder, nor did her family, okay? So... What happens is, and you can see, you've got this small little ventricle, and on top of that is stiff, non-compliant. So we have a contractile issue and a diastolic issue. And what results in that, with this remodeled myocardium, we've changed the walls in our house, electrical conduction pathways are altered, and the function of the muscle is altered. So, syncope, if they're exerting themselves and you've got this ventricle that's not allowing for adequate preload and it doesn't contract appropriately, they have a high tendency to pass out with the least little bit of exertion, okay, as this progresses. Very pronounced ventricular dysrhythmias. So what are we going to do? We're going to slow the heart down. Isn't that going to decrease oxygen consumption? Isn't that going to allow for more filling time. We're going to decrease the force of that contraction because once again, what is that going to do to myocardial oxygen consumption? It's going to decrease it. The drug of choice is carvedilol. Carvedilol is the beta blocker drug of choice to treat this disorder. Those running days are done. Those football days are over. We might be able to have the patient undergo a procedure where they go in and shave out part of that muscle, ventriculomyomectomy. They're going to take out some of that muscle. And accordingly, they will have an ablation of their node and a pacemaker, ICD combo, inserted. Why would I want this patient to avoid dehydration? Because it reduces volume, which is reducing what? Preload. And we already identified we have a problem with that in the first place, don't we? Okay. Now, restricted margin of my Let me go back to this one. Endocarditis. Endocarditis. Okay, so restrictive. You see this one right here, cardiomyopathy? The one on the far right. If you look at it carefully, it looks more like a V than a U. You see what I'm talking about? A little more like a V than a U. You have this uh, a, a similar effect. The walls aren't that much bigger than your others. This is a rare disorder. It typically occurs with your older population. Um, and it results in those stiff ventricles again. However, the treatment for this one's gonna be a little bit different. Um, 
things like sarcoidosis can cause this. Um, anyway, any torus organ disease process with the muscle itself. Okay, so I know sarcoidosis is one of the things that can cause it. So you end up with this little stiff ventricle. So what's the patient going to feel? Exertional dyspnea. Because once again, I need that ventricle to be able to contract, and I need to be able to rest during diastole and fill. Okay, so weakness. Again, things that would go along with the reduction of cardiac output. Exercise intolerance. Syncope. How do we treat it, though? This time, we can use diuretics. Whereas with my hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient, that's not what I want. Because of the stiff ventricle, in the absence of the other abnormalities that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has with it, we actually do need to make sure that this volume is not as in greater quantity so that we can ensure it's going the correct direction now, okay? That hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient's ventricles are so small, we can't afford for a reduction of volume. Again, we've remodeled the walls, so we've got antidiuretics. We're going to have afterload reducers, two vasodilators, controlling rhythm for the glycosides. These are just some of the different diagnostics we can use to look at and um, determine. You know, cardiac catheterization is the gold standard, right? It, it's got, it's going to let you see everything. The vessels, the structure of the heart, or the function, the flow going in and out of the heart muscle itself, um, through the valves. That's your gold standard, but not everybody is going to get that. They may start with an echocardiogram and use that, whatever. All right, transplant. Those dilated cardiomyopathy patients and potentially your hypertrophic. Y'all remember the movie John Q with Denzel? Listen, I like Denzel. If you've ever read anything about him, and I don't know if it's true what I've read, but I've read a lot about him, so you know, he's a good man. He has good, strong values, that I value. He, he's a good man. He better not disappoint me on divorcing. <laughs> don't be turning into nobody messing around with stupid stuff. But anyway. Um, you remember the movie John Q where he had his little boy mm -hmm. collapse his playing ball? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And his little boy had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in Hollywood terms. Okay, don't, don't take everything that happened in Hollywood, but just use it as kind of an example of what we're talking about here. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The baby needed a transplant, right? Mm -hmm. Boy's about six, seven, I don't know. Anyway, so we, our dilated cardiomyopathy, our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients are typically the ones that we would see this for. Now, the restrictive cardiomyopathy, no, because they are older. Remember, that happens later in life, okay? And, and, and we'll get to the ethical part of that in a minute. So who's a candidate? Who needs this? Well, New York Heart classification of a three or four, we're going to go through those steps in just a minute. A person who's under 65. Y'all, it, it may sound cruel, but it is the reality of where we're at with the decision-making process. If I've got a five-year-old versus a 70-year-old, it's not ethically responsible to give that heart to this 70-year-old who has lived, as opposed to this five-year-old that has a lot of life ahead of him, okay? Not to mention the comorbidities that that 70-year-old's gonna have that this five-year-old does not. There's a lot of logistics into who gets it, where we're gonna go with that. Um, they cannot be currently using any substances. So remember my alcoholic? We can't, we're not going to give you a heart if you're continuing to abuse these substances. So what they do is they do do random screens when that person's on the list. And if there's any evidence that they're continuing to use, they're off the list. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, stable psycho slash social status. That's two things, isn't it? Social status means what? I have resources and support. I have someone who can drop me to and from my appointments. I have someone who's going to be there at home to help me get better. Okay? Psycho status. What do we mean there? I'm mentally stable. I I'm, don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say here. I'm not making fun of anybody. But could we possibly do a transplant on a patient with paranoid schizophrenia? No, that wouldn't even be fair to your patient. They're paranoid, and you just put somebody else's heart in their body. 
they're probably not going to tolerate that. And I don't mean that in, in a comical way. I'm being dead serious. A stable psychological status, a stable social status. Okay, so we're looking at the support system the patient has, and we're looking at their psychological well-being. Um, talk about that. Obviously, if they've got an active infection going on, or like if your if your cardiac patient has severe pulmonary disease, they're not going to be a candidate for a transplant. One of the two systems has got to be working right, or they're not going to survive the procedure. Okay, so there are a lot of different thought goes behind who's going to get this. I don't want you to memorize this. I just want you to think through it, and then you can do it, and you'll have it in your brain forever. In a nutshell, a class one patient doesn't even know there's anything wrong with them. They're asymptomatic at rest. They're asymptomatic with normal activity. Only strenuous activity causes them any exertional dyspnea. Well, doesn't it you? Does me. Okay, so in other words, good to go. Your, your class two patient, what separates them from class one? Now when do they begin having symptoms? With normal physical activity. So looky here. They are, when we say ordinary physical activity, vacuuming, okay? Walking up a flight of stairs. Now they're recognizing that. I used to be able to vacuum my entire house without stopping. Now I'm having to stop after every run. I get tired washing my hair. Upper body activity increases heart rate faster. And so patients, I wash my hair, I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. Okay, that's a red flag. So we got a one and a two. One, good to go. Ordinary exertional activity causes them, I mean, excuse me, exertional activity causes them some short breath of whoopie do. It does everybody. A two, now we have ordinary physical exertion causes them some discomfort, but they're fine at rest and with minimal exertion. So if we go from a two to a three, what's the big hallmark between that two and that three person? What stands out between here? They're comfortable at rest, but any other activity, they're very uncomfortable. So if you imagine yourself in the hospital with this patient, in their chair, in their bed, they're fine. But when you get them up and try to transfer them from one to the other, they are beat. They are short of breath. They are like, I need to sit and rest a minute. Okay? That's your three. So what separates my three from my four? My four is that person that's miserable at rest. I cannot breathe. I cannot get comfortable. I, you know, a little bit of, there's that person that can't pull themselves up in the chair. You know what I'm saying? They can't push on their little armrest and scoot their booty up. They're so short of breath, you're, you're pulling them up. You're laying the chair back, pulling them up, sitting them back up. So we see we're one through four without memorizing a bunch of words on the screen. Okay? Just think through the process. Who was the candidate when they get to a three and a four? And that makes sense, right? I don't need a valve replacement if I just have to take breaks vacuuming my house. A valve replacement. A transplant. Not a water transplant if that's all I have in my head. I'll just, hey honey, this room's yours. <laughs> I mean, we can live like that. Okay, that's, that's reasonable. We can live that way. Um, but when we get to a three or four, now we're really significantly altering our ability to conduct normal life. Okay? So who's going to get it? Um, again, I don't want you to memorize it. I just want you to think through it. A lot of it makes perfectly good sense, right? We have age criteria. We have tissue that has to match. Body sizes that have to match needs. Um, typing, crossing, all that stuff's got to line up. If you get bored and you have nothing else to do, you can Google the final rule. It is an enormous document. But what it says in a nutshell is we no longer allow donor agencies to regulate themselves, themselves, like they did in the John Q days. We now, as a government, have stepped in and said, no, 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 no. Nancy Pelosi's husband with his mega millions isn't going to get this heart just because he has more money than John Q's son does. Fair, right? Absolutely. Geographical location isn't the only thing that's going to dictate to whether or not this patient gets the heart. Now, there is some geography that's involved, okay, because an organ is only viable for about four to six hour window. But in nowadays, we have planes, okay? So I can live in Dothan. Atlanta's a 45 minute hop by plane. There's no reason I can't get that organ to me in time or me get to them in time. 
right? Now, if you live in Barron, Alaska, you kind of out of luck, okay? It's a four-hour flight from Seattle to Anchorage, y'all. It's on up there. I'm just going to tell you. My husband couldn't sleep during the... Um, <laughs> so he's like, does the sun set? <laughs> so there is some geographical consideration we have to take, okay? But, but not like we used to. And, and the government said, okay, this is not cool. You are giving this to the people who paid you the best. That is not cool. We need to look instead who's the best match and has the greatest need for this organ. That's who needs to get this organ, okay? And that's what all that means. I'm not going to test you on anti-rejection drugs and all that. You had that in 201, and we're not even going to revisit that now. But I need you to understand what this patient's going to be on, okay? The old heart is not completely removed. Often, the posterior wall remains intact, and they anastomose the new heart to that posterior wall. What does that result in? Frequently, two P waves on your monitor. Old SA node, new SA node. However, this is so important for you to understand. Um, I talk about all this, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is so, so, so important for you to understand. This new heart is not innervated, it is denervated. What does that mean? It's not innervated, it is denervated. Those nerve endings are not going to respond to sympathetic stimulation. They're not connected. They're denervated. If something's innervated, it's innervated. <laughs> innervated, it's all connected. Everything's responding neurologically in terms of cell function, neural cell function, okay? Um, not neural cells, synapses, things that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Those cells that have to attach and make a little synapse and make something contract and move, etc., and respond with heart rate, it's not going to happen now. So what does that mean to me as a nurse? That means I need to recognize that when you and I get up in the morning and we sit on the edge of the bed, our heart rate's already going up. Because sympathetic stimulation says, okay, they change their position, we gotta make sure blood gets shunted to the brain. So we gotta go a little bit faster, and we gotta have a little more force. Oh, they're standing up, okay, now we gotta get those legs, those muscles in action, have adequate venous return, because we gotta get blood to the brain. Thank goodness all this works without me having to think about it, right? And it works through a system we call uh, sympathetic stimulation. This isn't going to happen for my patient here, so what do I need to teach them? Change, Change position slowly. <clears throat> if they start to go out for a walk, they need to give themselves longer time to warm up. Will they feel chest pain? No. So they can have an MI and never know it. So what do I need to tell them? What are the signs and symptoms of the sequel or associated with MI? Nausea, diuresis, vomiting. Not diaphoresis. It's also, it's also connected. But the nausea, the shortness of breath, the vomiting. They're going to need to be on all those immunosuppressant agents, all those um, agents that will help prevent a rejection. I'm not testing on that. Okay? I just, you just, you know that. If they've got another, body, another person's organ, they're going to have to have drugs to make sure they don't reject it. Um, pacemakers are often used on these patients. They usually do go ahead and ablate both nodes and insert a pacer. Now, because it's a real heart, that doesn't mean it's going to survive forever either. And many times they will go back to at least a one or a two within a few years, but it's, it's a natural tissue, okay? And if there's a physiological problem like atherosclerosis or chronic hypertension, etc., like that, then it can still make this heart sick too, okay? Don't worry about how long they live. I've, I had one, I ran into him at Lowe's, um, probably about three summers ago now. And it was so good to see him. I'm talking about a genuinely nice person. Um, he recognized me, I thought, oh my gosh, he looked great. He looked wonderful. And he's way past his, way past their years. But he's taking good care of himself. He's, he's, doing what he needs to do, right? and that's just move on. Okay, what do we have here? Which one is it, guys? It's A. It's, it, remember, with childbirth, is that dilated cardiomyopathy. It's primarily your alcoholic, but it can also occur during and after pregnancy. That increased workload, when you've got that little munchkin in there, you're increasing the workload on your own heart muscle, aren't you? 
Especially dilated. If this was, if what disorder would you see especially dilated cardiomyopathy? What is it, George? Yeah, I saw her say it with her lips. <laughs> that is correct. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start on the last one so that we have <coughs> plenty of time Tuesday to go over the high points that you need to investigate with. Uh, on, on, on. Um, pediatric anomalies, obviously guys, if I'm not spending class time, and I don't have Ms. Fuller in here doing class time <laughs> for pediatric anomalies, that tells you that it's not going to be the majority of the content, correct? It will be a nominal part. Now, it's enough that if you don't study, you could, you know, have a up, okay? But I'm focusing on the adult. Between now and Tuesday, make sure you do review what I said, tetralogy of fallot, atrial septal defect, ventral septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus, those are your biggies. And if you look at the way she's organized those slides, um, many of those anomalies are all in one, okay? And the effects are comparable. So don't confuse yourself and don't sit here and try to memorize 100 and whatever slides, it's nonsense. Look at the big picture. How would ventral septal defect affect perfusion in a newborn? How would an atrial septal defect affect perfusion in a child, newborn? Patent ductus arteriosus, tetralogy of fallot. What effect is this going to have on the patient? How do we treat it? How do we know that worked? Isn't that nursing process? What would you expect to find on assessment? Concept map's a great way to study these guys. What would you expect to find on assessment? What is your priority concern? What would we like to see achieved? How are we going to get there? And how do you know they work? Okay? Those are the big ones I want you to focus on. Okay? All right. Um, we're going to start with uh, alterations. <coughs> we're quite a way through this now. This is the treatment modality. It's like, what are we going to do about these different disorders? I'm not going to teach you ACLS because ACLS is a post licensure acquisition, but we are going to talk about what is ACLS as opposed to BCLS. What's the big difference, guys? Drugs, and what else? What's another one? What kind of airway have we got now? We have a secured airway as opposed to bag valve mask, right? And who is interpreting the rhythm with ACLS? The nurse, the person using the ACLS protocol. And AED tells the lay person what to do, doesn't it? <clears throat> in the AED, say, shock indicated, stand clear. <laughs> yes, Thelma. <laughs> in ACLS, it's the person running the code that's doing that. That, that person is interpreting the rhythm and knowing exactly what algorithm to follow as a consequence of the rhythm that they've seen. Okay, so we have drugs, we have a stable airway, and we have the person interpreting and following the protocol for the, the algorithms as opposed to a machine that says, well, hopefully, you know, it doesn't tell you to turn it on because it isn't on yet. So hopefully you at least turn it on. And from that point forward, it tells you what to do, right? So a lay person can use that. Right. Um, there are some meds. I'm not going to, the meds that you will have for this module are right. Vasopressin is a form of vasopressin. I usually bring it into module D, but epinephrine will be one of those ones you, you're going to be assigned in um, module E as well. So many of these drugs you're going to see with module E. Okay, so I don't want to replicate that. The drugs I've given you in class that we have talked about are the ones that are on this exam. If it's in form made easy, it's fair game. Okay. Um, this is another big thing here I was talking about a minute ago that the provider for ACLS is the one that's going to tell us when we need to defibrillate or cardioversion versus the machine. So what's the difference between cardioversion and defibrillation? Say it again, John. 
we're going to be doing stuff and increase our insurance choice. Okay, essentially, but defibrillation is also going to do that. So what's the key difference between the two? Cardioversion still has a pulse. Okay, so when we cardiovert, even the ACLS person has to have medicine at bedside. Okay, and I'm not, I'm not trying to sound morbid here, but if a patient doesn't have a pulse, it can't get any worse. So, per ACLS guidelines, I don't have to have a doctor at bedside for me to defibrillate. We can't get dead or we are dead. And I don't mean it morbidly, I'm just saying, seriously. They already don't have a pulse, it can't get any worse than this. Cardioversion, because you can get worse, we can have a complication, you cannot shock by the presence of a physician at bedside. Cardioversion syncs with the upstroke of an R wave, so the device will detect that upstroke of an R wave to synchronize that shock, whereas defibrillation doesn't care where it gets on the waveform. It's going to, it'll shock when, it, and when you hit shock, it shocks right then. With cardioversion, when you hit shock, it, there's going to be a delay because it's waiting till it reads the appropriate time to deliver that shock, okay? So cardioversion, your patient still has a pulse. So it might be AFib with RBR, due onset, and patient's very hemodynamically unstable. It could be VTAC with a pulse. Defibrillation is VFib or VTAC without a pulse. That's it. Why would I not shock a systole? Because what Josh was saying just a minute ago, the purpose of a shock, whether it's delivered through cardioversion or through defibrillation, is to stop the nonsense and let normal behavior ensue. Kind of like, my husband hates when I turn on Turner Classic Movies. The minute he sees black and white, he won't even visit to see if it's a good movie. He's like, oh, I'm like, listen, it's a good movie. It's like, no, it's not. But I agree with him when it gets to those little old hysterical women that, I'm like, pick up the knife, bozo. Ah, can't stand it. What do we do to hysterical women in those days? <laughs> what did they do when they were slapped? Other than to fix their lipstick, what did they do? They, that's shock and all. Did you just do that? And normal behavior followed, okay? When we shock a myocardium, we're saying, stop the nonsense. Get your act together. So you're going to see nothing for a moment after the shock's delivered, a little short pause, and then you hold your breath and you hope that a normal mechanism is going to pick back up. That's what we're doing, okay? So regardless if it's cardioversion or defibrillation, we're stopping the nonsense completely, hoping that normal behavior is going to return. That's what we're doing, okay? We're shopping the hysterical, hysterical chick. All right, so remember I also told you when you have a person coming under an arrest situation, regardless of their age, until we find out what's caused it, it's likely that they're going to do this again. So we got to quickly go down this pathway, okay, what caused this? What went wrong? So we've got the five H's and five T's. You do not need to memorize them. I want you to understand and look at them. These are the things that we quickly rule out because it is a, these are common causes of an arrest situation. In a child, what's the most common cause of an arrest? Which system? Is it respiratory or cardiovascular? Respiratory. Okay, in an adult, it's typically cardiovascular. All right. Um, bypass. This is one of the things we can do for a patient with severe coronary artery disease. I know in 202, y'all go up through angioplasty. Bypass surgery is something we can do. We've got a patient who has severe coronary artery disease and they're not responding well to medication therapy or due to the nature of the lesions, we need to be, some, be a little more aggressive, okay? So, what can we use as a graft? Um, the, you've got your right internal mammary and your left internal mammary arteries that make really great grafts. The LIMA, L-I-M-A, left internal mammary artery, is often used. I would say probably 90% of the time you're going to see the LIMA graft used. It's ar arterial by nature, and what we're bypassing is an artery, right? So it's great that we have an artery bypass another artery. Um, it's right there on the chest wall already, so nothing dies when we take it away. There's enough vasculature there to feed that chest wall, and it makes a wonderful graft. Otherwise, we have, we used to use radial arteries, we don't use them anymore. Um, you would see a patient, and you might still see them in the healthcare setting today, they would have an incision down the entire length of their arm. 
where they harvested the radial artery. The hand didn't die, nothing suffered here, because you have an ulnar artery. You can't palpate it, it's deep, but it's there and it fed the hand. But because there could have been some residual weakness, they would use the non-dominant hand, okay? The problem with it, though, and we didn't know till later, is it tended to spasm. You know what I'm saying when I'm, okay, nobody needs an artery spasm, okay, because that's gonna alter perfusion. So they don't do those as much anymore. I haven't seen one done in a long time. So then we're left with donor grafts, cryographs, or the patient's own saphenous graft. Used to, and you might still see people today that have these scars, they would go from the groin to the ankle, the entire length of the leg, and take the vein out. Now you can imagine healing was a problem, especially at the knee area and the groin area. This is a moist, dark area. Bacteria loves that, and it's hard to heal, and the knee's constantly being mobile. So it was really hard to heal those. Now they do skip incisions, and so you'll see a little one inch incision above the ankle, a little one inch incision around the lower below the knee, sometimes a little above it. Much better healing, much quicker healing, and they would strip the vein out that way. The problem is with that though, remember, we're bypassing arteries. Now I have a vein, and will a vein function like an artery? No, okay, so I'll get to that in a second. I'll get to it right now. Um, arteries have that smooth muscle action and they tend to have less, less um, likelihood that they're going to occlude. A saphenous graft doesn't last near as long and they tend to occlude pretty quickly, especially in a patient who continues to smoke. I've seen saphenous grafts occluded within three months of bypass surgery for patients who continue to smoke. All right, so lots of responsibilities preoperatively and postoperatively. So we've got to get the patient ready. We're looking at how much time do I have to prepare this patient? Is this an emergent situation or do I have some time? Are we coming back in a few days for this uh, surgical procedure electively? That's ideal, because then you have time to prepare the patient, prepare them for the environment, all the bells and whistles, all the equipment, all the different disciplines they'll be interacting with. Um, sometimes you don't because it's an emergency situation and you, you work along the way with them as far as education is concerned. Pain control is imperative. When I tell you that a lack of pain control can cause your patient's death, I am serious. How is it possible that a lack of adequate pain control can lead to my patient's death? Say it again. Okay, keep going. What are you not going to do when you hurt? Okay, I've got, my breastbone has been sawed in half like a horror movie. My chest has been flipped open like a chicken and then put back together with wire. And you want me to cough? What do you think my answer is going to be? Heck no. Because pain is a built-in physiological protective mechanism, isn't it? It's built in to protect you, right? If I didn't have pain sensors, would I not keep my hand on that hot burner? I would, wouldn't I? Oh, I have no idea it's burning. Well, oh, heck. Pain is built in to protect you from further injury. It is very hard for you to logically override that. Okay? So when we're dealing with a patient who doesn't want to take a deep breath because it hurts really bad, and I sure ain't going to cough or sneeze, I'm not going to walk because I hurt everywhere. We've got to get pain under control so that our patient will participate in the activities that we need that will prevent complications like pneumonia, PE, etc. They have to be able to be mobilized. They have to be able to do deep breathing cough. If we don't, we're going to have some dire consequences, okay? So pain control is very important. Establishing a pain control plan with your patient ahead of time. You have to think about different cultures here too. And you have to think about our own society Gentlemen, is it cool in our society for you to have pain? It's not. 
Is it cool in some cultures for a patient to display that they're in pain? My mother's culture is extremely stoic. Okay? We have to re investigate that. Okay, we have to we have to find a pain control plan for this patient. We also have to help our patient understand we've got to be able to keep this in control because this is what's going to happen if not. Okay, so think about these things, the, the barriers. They all goes back to fundamentals. Um, it's scary, you guys, when you tell somebody they're going to stop their heart and we're going to work on it and then we're going to hope it restarts. It's kind of scary, right? So. Be kind, be patient, understand that what they're feeling is pretty scary, okay? And work with them. Again, cardiac rehab differs from PT, how? PT is there to fix functional deficits due to skeletal or musculoskeletal problems, right? Cardiac rehab, we're not talking about musculoskeletal problems here. We're talking about a heart that needs to be rehabilitated. So there's a protocol for how to advance exercise. There's a protocol to watch hemodynamic responses to exercise and how to pace that patient forward. I already talked about the bypass machine. Moving on. There's a picture of it. The person who runs this machine is called a perfusionist. Whatever that's worth. Moving on. Alright. <laughs> Off pump bypass. I haven't seen these done in quite some time now. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. Off-pump bypass was the one situation where we could do bypass surgery on a beating heart. They did not have to stop the heart. But the lesion had to be on the anterior surface, so like the left anterior descending artery, had to be easily accessible and they couldn't have multiple vesicle disease. But it, the benefit of it is the patient didn't go off the heart on a bypass machine. And there were better outcomes. Because I mean, let's face it, a machine's never going to do the same thing as a human body does. So these patients did tend to have better outcomes. But again, they're not a candidate if they have multiple vessel disease. They're not a candidate if the lesion's on the inferior wall or posterior wall. Moving right along from that. Okay. I had a patient one time ask me, is that artery just going to stick out there like that? Won't something catch on it and pull it? You know, you, you have to remember how your brain is going to think differently now because you are educated on these matters. Their brain is not going to think that way, which is why you need to let your patient ask questions because you're not going to anticipate all their questions. Because we know better, but they don't. And we need to make sure they understand that. No. How big is your heart muscle, guys, in layman's explanation? How big is it? Make a fist and look at it. There you go. That's about the size of your heart muscle. Not too much bigger than that. How big are those arteries? About the size of an overcooked spaghetti noodle. We're definitely not al dente. <laughs> or spongy. Okay? So when we're talking about these, we're talking about something that's really quite small in reality. That's a, the picture over here on the right shows you how they took the left internal mammary, which is already attached on one of the arch roots, and they severed it from the chest wall, and they went around the area that's occluded. We bypassed the blocked area so that we restore blood flow distally. In other words, Let's say, the, let's say the area that was diseased is right here. Would it do us any good to attach this up here? No, because we still don't have blood flow distally. Our goal is to restore distal to the lesion, okay? And so that's what the bypass will do. So we've got the lima graft here, and then we've got the saphenous grafts here. Why did they initially attach the first part to the aorta? Because it's big, and the chances of it including them are slim compared to attaching it to the native vessel of origin to the distal end of it. Okay? Be aware, y'all, they can't bypass everything. If it's a lesion that's, you know, you've got your three coronary arteries, y'all know those from last semester, right? You've got your RCA, your LAD, and your left circumflex. Each of these arteries has multiple branches, and every branch has a name. I won't test y'all that. Okay? You've got diagonals, marginals, ramuses. Each one of them has names. It can be a little posterior branch. Well, what do you want to bypass? There's nothing to go to. There's, we, we're going to let that little area infarct. It's going to be a small scar, and they're going to go on their way. But if it's an LAD lesion that's way up here, isn't that going to take out the whole left ventricle? Okay, so we got to we got to fix that. Now I want to point out this to you right here. You see this little shadow vessel behind here? Y'all see that? That's called the left main. That is, you know, that widowmaker. Everybody calls the LAD. It's really not the LAD. It is the left main because the left main is what splits in two the left anterior descending and the left circumflex. If that bad boy is occluded, you've lost two-thirds of your heart's blood supply. 
Do you all see the picture? You see what I'm, what I'm talking about? If a patient has left main disease, they're going to get a bypass. Okay? So we got a patient here with left main disease and some RCA disease, and they, even though it's showing you LAD, they clearly had LAD lesion too. Okay? Everybody okay so far? All right. So what do I need to do? Your immediate post-op period is, is busy. Um, they don't go to recovery. They don't go to PACU. This patient goes straight from the OR to your intensive care. You're going to be the one continuing to rewarm the patient, monitoring preload, afterload, contractility, the works, rhythm. Rhythm's a real problem. So we got lots of, you'll, have, you ever, have you ever seen a cabbage patient come back? Revival? They've got at least six drips going. So you've got two cabbage module pumps, three on each side, at least. Okay, because we've got drugs that are affecting contractility, preload, afterload, insulin drip, rhythm drugs. We've got all kinds of things going on. Okay, at least six drips on when they come back up. They're intubated. They have a temporary pacemaker. They have a PA catheter. They have chest tubes. May or may not also have a balloon pump. Just a little random trivia at Flowers Hospital. You know that extra large elevator on 3 South? Okay. That was my generation. When we moved cardiovascular care from where it used to be on 3 North to the South Tower, the only way Dr. Plans was going to be okay with moving CB from first floor directly across the OR to third floor is to ensure him that we would get his patients back to the OR promptly. You guys, you can't fit those patients on a regular elevator. They won't fit. It's, it's a disaster. We needed an elevator big enough to accommodate that. That was the only way to appease Dr. Plans. I love Dr. Plans, y'all. Uh, he, was, he was a good man. The only way to appease him was to build this elevator large enough to assure him that when we go from three sa this south tower, we will be back down to the OR in a timely manner. Okay? Because we wanted to combine cardiovascular care, and that's what we did. Um, so back to what I'm saying. There's a lot of responsibilities for the patients when they come back post-operatively. We've got a lot of monitoring we're going to do, and you'll find that the nurse has a, a considerable amount of autonomy because they've got protocols to function within. So this is what we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, obviously, any, uh, any post-op patient, we're going to work about, worry about bleeding and infection, right? Okay, that's, that's standard. Um, we can auto transfuse when we give the patient their blood right back if they are bleeding out too much. Hopefully they're not. Um, protamine was for what? What's protamine for you? Antidote to? That's right. Protamine sulfate. Amicar is an anti fibrinolytic. So let's take that word apart. Anti fibrinolytic. Okay, let's start with the suffix. What is a lytic? What does a lytic do? It breaks something down, right? What does it break down? Well, what's in front of it? In this case, it's fibrin. If I said it was a thrombolytic, what's it breaking down? A thrombus, okay? Now I'm saying it's a fibrinolytic. So it's breaking down fibrin, right? But if we go to the prefix, it says anti. So what is it saying? It's not letting fibrin get broken down. <laughs> See how that, so we did it? Y'all don't get scared by words like that in class. Don't say, what? <laughs> Just take it apart. You control it, don't let it control you. So, uh, 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 I got this. I know what lytic means, I know what that means, and I know what that means. So that means it must do this. Okay, anti-fibrinolytic. Because right now, we don't want the patient freely bleeding, right? I don't want something that's gonna break down my fibrin. Fibrin's one of those things that helps make a clot. Okay, all right. I'm not testing you on chest tubes until module B, but I do want you to use critical thinking. Think of it as another form, it's, it's not, the primary purpose isn't as a drain. It has multiple functions that way, but we do monitor drainage. A unit of blood is about 450 mils, about. So if a patient's lost 200 milliliters already, what have they lost? That's a lot of blood. So when we start having consecutive two hours, like wait a minute, now something's bleeding in there. Conversely, if you have, let's just get chest tube out of our brain altogether, and let's just think about a JP drain. You have a JP drain and it's been consistently draining, all of a sudden it's stopped. That's right, something's clotted off somewhere. That worries me, right? It should. Am I gonna ignore it? No, I, I need to investigate that. 
if your chest tube suddenly stops draining blood or fluid, we have to ask ourselves, okay, where is it? It can cause, that happened just last semester, my students. I was so proud of her. She had to do compressions on a not even two hour old open heart surgery patient. I mean, she was scrambling to get her chair, pregnant and all. You could hold her back. She said, Oh, I want to do it. <laughs> now you knock yourself out. The, but the, what had happened was the drainage in the chest tube had stopped, and the nurse had contacted the provider who was in another case. All this blood is filling in the chest cavity. What effect is that going to have on your cardiac output, guys? Why is it decreased? That's right, because of extra volume in that chest cavity. That's exactly right. Decreases venous return. All this extra pressure created by the extra volume caused a tamponade. Okay? Again, you got to use your critical thinking. But that would be if a patient had a JP drain in in their abdomen. I'm worried about, okay, nothing just stops. What's it doing? Where's it at? Okay? And so you, you use a clinical judgment. Don't get tripped up in, I don't know anything about chest tubes. You do understand drainage. Okay? And that's where I'm going to be as far as testing you. Um, your priorities. Monitoring for signs of a tampon. Muffled heart sounds. <coughs> causes that would contribute to that, like, hey, where is my drainage going? What's going on with this? Why don't I have any chest tube drainage? That's not normal. Muffled heart sounds, JVD, pulses, paradoxes, monitoring for that tamponade. Um, okay, we are very aggressive with these patients because we know the more aggressive we are, the better they're going to be. You do not need to memorize this. I just want to give you a, a timeline. We want them off the vent in 8, in the chair in 12, and on their feet in 24. Very aggressive. Off, up, up. Because we found that the quicker we mobilize these patients, the better they're going to be. And again, they're going to look at you like you are crazy. Like you want me to do what? Do you not see what I'm attached to? Yeah, we got that. That's what pockets are for, hands are for, arms are for. All I want you to do, hold that pillow and we'll help you to a standing position. I got all the equipment, chest tubes and all. We're going to go. They, we were very aggressive with getting them up and mobilizing because people do better, don't they? Isn't that true of any surgical procedure though? Okay, so it's nothing I have to memorize with a heart patient. Now, neurological complications is another priority here. Because we're dealing with diseased arteries, isn't it possible that a plaque piece from within that artery breaks off? Okay. Um, your elderly, isn't it true that I can take an elderly patient who is completely lucid during the day put them in a environment that's new to them and they're still lucid during the day, but night comes and what the heck, right? Morning comes and they're back to their sweet little self. Okay, isn't that normal anyway? Okay, so with our elderly patients, we really wanna watch that, okay? Um, they're more subject to the neurological complications as well. My American grandmother never, never woke up after her valve replacement. She had a massive intraox stroke and never, never woke up. They're more suspect to these things, okay? Post-pericardiotomy delirium often occurs with your um, addicts and we didn't know they were addicts, okay? So when we're querying our patient on their substance use, your professional approach matters, doesn't it? We're not here to judge them and we're certainly not gonna be making a ring a dingy dingy to the dozen police department. They need to know that, don't they? I'm not ethically allowed to do that. If you're here and you're not a citizen of the United States, I'm not allowed to report you, correct? Because it's none of my business. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to take care of you, right? Okay, so when you're getting your patient's history of use of substances, that professional approach, making your patient comfortable that you're not judging them, might get you an accurate result. But if your patient's not forthcoming with you, is it because they want to lie, or why are they not being honest about what they're using? They're afraid they won't get the procedure. Say again? They're afraid they won't get the procedure on them. It's possible. Embarrassed. Embarrassed. A, a big reason your addict is never going to really tell you what they're using is because they're going to protect the addiction. Okay? And that's natural. I want you, again, to understand the receptors of the brain have been altered. So, as much as I love you guys, and I do, I love my students and I, I care about you, 
if there's one little molecule of oxygen left in this room and it's this corner, you're going to have to fight me to get it. Because <laughs> I'm going to be scrambling all over y'all. I want that last molecule. <laughs> That's normal physiological built-in survival, isn't it? That's why people who go out there and rescue people in the ocean who aren't trained often end up drowning themselves, right? Because even though you're trying to rescue this other person, their fight or flight's kicked in so bad that now they're drowning you. My husband and I saw a young man got rescued just this weekend. Did I tell you that? Mm -hmm. I told my clinical group, didn't I? Oh, yeah, I told y'all. So. Um, young boy got into the no swimming zone area where the red flags were, and we watched him. My husband said, oh, he is making nowhere. He, he, he was swimming and going nowhere. And that lifeguard was on it. And he, boogie, 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 right on that, there, that board. <laughs> you know, but, but very well trained and stayed on the opposite end of the boogie board. And the boy got on, he was about, like a, I don't know, a preteen, 12, 14, somewhere around there. And he got him safely over the side. But an untrained person's not gonna know how to handle that, okay, and they end up drowning themselves. So what well, my point is, fight or flight kicks in, your, your intrinsic drive to survive is gonna override everything. Your addict sees that substance, their brain does, as that last molecule of oxygen in the room. You have to understand that, okay? So don't judge them, don't say, oh, is it cool? So I'm, I'm talking to Jay's spouse, and Jay's spouse says, I only drink about a drink a night. Can I go to Jay and say, hey, what do they really drink? Can I do that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Now, he may come to me and say, look, I know my partner or wife said I drink this much, that she drinks this much, he drinks this much, but this is what they really consume. I can document that, can I? Mm -hmm. I didn't solicit it. I didn't ask for it. And I'm not going to change a word the, the family member said. I'm going to put it directly in quotes. And I'm going to contact my provider and say, hey, just want to let you know this is the data, whatever. Because now we can proactively prevent that withdrawal from happening. This is not the time. I have seen patients die, y'all, going through withdrawal after surgery. Because it's not a mental process. It's just it's a physiological process. And we have to understand that, OK? So post-pericardial delirium. You can't get them off the vent. Um, they're complicated patients. And it goes back to my query of what substances they're using and being alert for the signs and symptoms of that, okay? Um, I talked, you know, about preventing infection. Nobody needs to tell you that. Urine output again. Remember, urine output is very indicative of cardiac output, isn't it? Okay, if my cardiac output is adequate, I'm going to have good urine output. Patient Ed. Okay, I'm gonna stop here because I will pick up with the rhythms because we're gonna be pacemakers too, and that gets confusing. So between now and Tuesday, you look over those pediatric anomalies. You should have a root a, a, a crude construction of a concept map just flowing through the processes of what would I expect to find on assessment for the tetralogy of Hello Baby. What are my concerns? In other words, what's being affected, what's not normal now? How do we treat that? In other words, your goal, what are we going to do about that to restore something going normal? What are those treatments and those interventions and how do we know that they worked? Okay? Those anomalies I listed to you is what you want to focus on. There's plenty in there, but those are where I want you to put your, your time. Okay? All right. Any questions? Uh -huh. Sorry, the pediatric alterations you mentioned, are those the ones on the syllabus outline? They're on that, yes, but but I don't, I'm are not going to go that deep into those. That's why, I, okay. if you'll go to the slides that are in the course, did y'all find those? Y'all know what I'm talking about? They're in your course, and she's actually, Ms. Fuller's got her notes on there. Y'all know Ms. Fuller? Yes. Yes, Ms. Fuller is a neonatal nurse practitioner. This is her area of expertise. I don't do much of it. Ms. Fuller created these slides for you. I take care of pediatric patients, but that's not my thing. Oh my gosh, how many times do I have to do this? Okay, 
if you come down here, pediatric alterations right here. 112. No. <laughs> okay. But she does have them broken down. Like I said, I, I want you, I've told you what I want you to focus on. General heart disease, we're going to move right on, right on, right on. I'm just talking about incidences and whatever. Um, she just wants you to understand how blood flow through the heart is for a baby different to little munchkins born and then after birth. That's just for going back to, uh, here we go, is that ductus? Okay, so she's going to normal function here. And then down here, so you're going to start having your little problems, okay? Okay, so you'll look through until you get to, bing, fatal ductus ulteriosus. But you had to under, remember, you guys, you have to understand normal in order to understand abnormal, which is why she's got those review there for you before, okay? And just scroll through. All of her notes are here. In other words, everything she would have said out loud. Okay? All right, guys. I will see you Tuesday. You're going to do your homework on your drugs. You're going to do your research on... Um, Thiazide induced hyperglycemia. We're going to compare and contrast of glutamine and dopamine. Okay? And y'all have a